Welcome to the Future of Life Institute podcast. My name is Gus Dogger. This is a special episode of the podcast featuring Nathan LeBenz interviewing Flo Crivello. Flo is an AI entrepreneur and the founder of Lindy AI. Nathan is the co-host of the Cognitive Revolution podcast, which I recommend for staying up to date on AI. Here is Flo and Nathan. Man, you know, it's... um. It's a tough time for somebody that tries to keep up with everything going on in AI. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's gone from, you know, in 2022, I felt like I could largely keep up and, you know, wasn't like missing whole major arcs of, you know, important stories. And now I'm like, yeah, I'm like, like totally let go of like AI art generation, for example, and this policy stuff is really hard to keep up with, especially this week. Of course, it's like hitting a, you know, a fever pitch all at once. But you know, it's I love it, so I can't really complain at all. It's just um, at some point, you know, got to admit that I have to maybe narrow scope somehow, or just let some things fall off. I'm I'm just kind of wrestling with that a little bit. Which which I think is just like a natural. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I hear you. Uh, I think it's just a natural part of like the industry evolving. It's like imagine you know, talking about like keeping up with computers, right? Uh, in like the 80s or something. It's like, I'm sure at some point it was possible to keep up with computers at large. And now it's like keeping up with tech is just like, it's like, okay, dude, it's like, it's like half the GDP or whatever, right? You're doing all this in your second language, right? I, this is, um, I assume right. English is, is your second at least. I have an excuse. Yeah, second. Uh, I'm actually getting my American citizenship. I had this interview just yesterday. Wow, congratulations. That's great. I know it's not an easy process, although maybe it would, it's about to get streamlined. I haven't even read that part of the executive order yet, but I understand that there is kind of a accelerated path for AI expertise. Have you seen what that is? No, but generally there's good stuff being done in immigration. Like they're relaxing a lot of visa requirements. They're like closing a lot of loopholes. They're, they're doing a lot of really good stuff. Yeah, I've been thinking of um, just as kind of a general communication strategy, if nothing else, calling out the domains in which I am accelerationist, which are in fact many. And I think you know you and I are pretty similar in this respect, where it's like, um, perhaps the singular question of the day, I am not an accelerationist, but on so many other things, I very much am an accelerationist. And like, streamlining immigration would be one of those, you know, I would sooner sign up for the 1 billion Americans plan than kind of you know, the build the wall plan, certainly. And I just did a right before this was doing an episode on autonomy and, you know, self driving. And that's another one where I'm like, holy moly, you know, I don't know if you have a, a take on this, but the the recent cruise episode, I find to be, you know, kind of bringing my internal Mark and uh, very much to the fore where I'm like, we're going to let one incident a, like shut down this, you know, whole thing in California, that seems crazy enough. But then the fact that they go out and like, do this whole sort of performative self, I mean, whether it's performative or not, maybe it's sincere, but do this whole self flagellation thing and, you know, shut the whole thing down nationwide. I'm like, can we, where is our inner Travis on this people? You know, somebody has to um, stand up for something here at some point. Totally. I agree. I think it's just the natural order of things, right? It's like, I don't know if you know that piece of history about when the automobile came about. There was this insane law that said you needed to have someone walking with a flag in front of the automobile at no more than like four miles an hour, right? So it's part of the process, man. It's infuriating. I hate it, but in some way, and maybe it's cool, but I made peace with it. I'm like, it's part of the process. You can't really stop progress. It's going to do its thing. So... Eh. It doesn't really matter anyway, because like the self-driving cars are not really deploying at a very large scale. And so I'm like, Ugh. you know, it's not a bottleneck anyway. I, I don't think it is. I guess I have two reactions to that. One is like, it feels like if they if nobody kind of fights through this moment, then there is like this potential for kind of the nuclear outcome where, you know, we just kind of get stuck and it's like, sorry, you know, the standards are so insane. You've got to be you know, we do have a little bit of like a chicken and egg problem where, you know, if you had a perfect self-driving car, they'd let you deploy it, but you're not going to get to perfect unless you can kind of deploy it. And, you know, it, to me, this technology is just an incredible example of where, you know, the relative risk is already pretty high. As far as I can tell, they already do seem to be 
as safe or marginally safer, you know, maybe as much as order of magnitude safer already, depending on exactly what stats you look at. And I would just hate to see us get kind of, you know, as we're like kind of close to maybe some sort of tipping point threshold, whatever, to get stuck in a bad equilibrium of, you know, never get, and then, you know, maybe get stuck and never get out of that chicken and egg thing would just be so frustrating. I drive a 2002 trailblazer that I have sworn never to replace unless it's with a self-driving car. And it's becoming increasingly difficult to um, keep this thing going, you know, so I'm like, how long do I have to wait? My other take on this is I think Tesla is actually like really good. I borrowed a neighbor's. I don't know if you've done the the FSD mode recently. My grandmother came up for a visit. It was fun. I actually took you know my 90-year-old grandmother on a, a trip back to her home, which is like a four-hour drive there. And then I did four hours back all in one kind of big FSD experiment. I set up my laptop in the back, put a seatbelt on my laptop. So it was like recording me and recording us, you know, driving. So I could kind of look at the tape later. And I was like, man, this is really good. It, I had no doubt in my mind coming out of that experience that it, it's a better driver than like other people I have been in the car with, you know, for, for starters. So I'm like thinking through my like personal life, I'm like, yeah, I'd rather be in the car with an FSD than this person and that person and this other person, you know, and I'd be definitely more likely to let it drive my kids than this other person. So I felt like it was really good. And then the other thing that was really striking to me was the things where it messed up. I mean, there weren't many mess ups for one thing, but like the few mess ups that we had, there were, there were a couple in an eight hour thing. It was like, if we actually had any mojo and we went around kind of cleaning up the environment, we could solve a lot of this stuff. Like there was one that my neighbor who lent me the car said, you know, you're going to get to this intersection right there on the way to the highway and it's going to miss the stop sign because there's a tree in the way. And I was like, you know, for one thing, probably people miss that too. Like let's trim the trees. You know, and then there's another one where you're getting off the highway and there's a stop sign that's kind of ambiguous, like it's meant for the people on the service road, but it appears to be facing you as you're coming off the highway. And so the car saw that and stopped there. And that was probably the most dangerous thing that it did was, you know, stopping where people, you know, coming up the off ramp, like do not want you or expect you to be stopped there. But that's another one where you could just go like put up a little blinder, you know, to just very easily solve that problem. And I imagine people must have that problem, too. And we just have no, no will, you know, when it comes to that. And again, it's, I feel like I'm turning into Mark Andreessen the more I think about self-driving over the last few days. No, I, I'm with you on that. So where else are you um, accelerationist that may not be obvious as we kind of think about um, this, you know, this kind of AI safety and regulation moment that we're in? Uh, you know, honestly, pretty much everywhere, man, like I, I'm a libertarian, like I used to work at Uber where I saw regulatory capture and I saw cartels and I do believe you know, at the deepest level that cartels and regulatory capture and generally, I think it's Menke Olson who calls them extractive inst institutions who are just in the business of, uh, they don't want to grow the pie, they just want to grab a little bit more of the pie for themselves. Even if it actually shrinks the pie, they don't care as much as they get a bigger chunk. And I think that the world is just rotten with thousands and thousands of these institutions, whether without a private or whether other unions or governmental, it doesn't matter. We just have so many of these cartels floating around and it's killing everything, right? It's a tragedy. And I, I totally understand how folks like Mark Morrison would be, is they have built such a deep and justified hatred and reaction for this nonsense that is destroying everything that they immediately just the pattern recognition immediately triggers when they see what's happening with the AI. They're like, ah, it's happening again. They're doing it again. And it's like, chill. I totally get it. But this time is really different. Like This is really something special that's happening. Not just in the markets, not just in the economy, not just in the country, in the universe. Like there is a new form of life that's being built and this is, we're like a new territory and we need to be careful right now, right? And so that's, that's where I'm coming from is like, I totally see that point of view and I'm like, regulation 
for sure, there's going to be cartels. For sure, we're going to screw up 90% of it. Politics is going to get messy and trenched interests are going to get into play. And it's all worth it because what may very well be on the line, it sounds alarmist, but I'm sorry, like we need to say the words, may be literally human extinction, right? And this is not some tinfoil hat theory. There's more and more experts that are coming around and saying that. It's actually funny, Mark and Reeson, if you dig it up, I'm sure you could find it. I think it was an interview from him, I want to say between 2017 and 2020. That doesn't help you on that because he gives so many of those. But I think he said something like, at the time, he was actually appealing to an argument of authority. He was like, look, he was saying the same things he's saying today. Progress is good. It's just a tool. And by the way, the experts say there's nothing to worry about. So I don't know. You guys don't know anything about AI. I don't know anything about AI. They do. And, and they're telling us there's nothing to worry about. That argument is not true anymore. The experts are telling us there is something to worry about. And now it's just like, oh, arbitrary, like uh, regulatory capture. No, no, it's not regulatory capture. Like OpenAI was funded on that premise from day one. So if, if it was regulatory capture, that's like one hell of a plan. It's like, oh my God, we're going to create this industry and, 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 and we're going to start regulatory capturing right now. Right? It's like, that makes no sense. Like it, was, it was literally the plan from day one. Yeah, that's where I'm coming from. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm largely in the EAC camp. I am in team technology, team progress, team anti-regulation. But here, something very special and potentially very dangerous is happening. So let's go back to your use of the phrase, a new form of life. I, as you, you know, may recall, am very anti-analogy as ways as a way to understand AI because I think it's so often misleading. And like, you know, I, I often kind of say, AI, artificial intelligence, alien intelligence, it may be tempting for people to kind of hear, or not tempting, but it may be sort of natural for people to hear you say a new form of life and understand that as an analogy. But do you mean it as an analogy? Or, you know, I guess we might start to think about like, is that actually just literally true? And, and what, what conditions would need to exist for it to be literally true? And you might think about things like, can AI systems like reproduce themselves you know can they are they like subject to the laws of evolution uh, but like how, for starters how literal do you mean it when you say that there's this like new form of life in ai i, I mean it pretty literally i think if you zoom all the way out literally from the birth of the universe the evolution of the universe has been towards greater and greater degrees of self-organization of matter and there's actually a case to be made that this is just a natural Consequence of the second law of thermodynamics. There's this amazing book that EAC people love to quote, which Yeah, I was gonna say, you're sounding very EAC all of a sudden. <laughs> it's it's a good point. It's called Every Every Life is on Fire, right? Um, and so if you look at the Big Bang, we would you know uh, like a few fractions of a second after the Big Bang, it was just uh, subatomic particles and then they ganged up together and formed atoms, and then the stage after that was the atoms ganged up together and formed molecules. And then the stage after that, the molecules became bigger and bigger because they formed into stars and exploded and caused all sorts of reactions. And so a few generations of stars later, we have like pretty big molecules and pretty heavy ones. Um, and then these molecules form into sort of like protein and RNA and forms of proto-life. We don't totally understand. There's a chain here that we don't, don't totally understand, but there's a form of proto-life that formed and then life. And so you can think of like, I thought it was just a, DNA, or like actually it was RNA, DNA, nucleus of a cell, cell, mitochondria came into that. And then, okay, cool, we have a cell. And then the cells have started ganging up together. And now we have multicellular organisms. And then we have brains at some point, like that's like a big leap, but we have brains like on, on that great march towards to greater and greater degrees of self-organization. And at some point we have us, which with a little bit of hubris, perhaps I am uh, considering the apex of that, of that thing for now. It just seems crazy to me that everybody is saying like, one, this is totally normal. Like, well, oh, this is normal, we're normal. It's like, dude, this is quite quintillions of atoms that are organized in this weird, super coherent fashion and that are pursuing a goal in the universe. Like, what's happening right now on Earth is already weird to begin with, right? So people are all deep thinking that this is normal and, and that's what it is, and that this march is going to stop at them, right? And they're like, well, maybe we're going to get slightly, slightly smarter or maybe we're going to get augmented. And I'm like... The, the, you are such a leap compared to an atom, right? Or compared to a bacteria that like there is no reason to expect that there wouldn't be another thing above you that is as much more complex or bigger than you 
as a renewal to the bacteria. Like there's nothing in the universe that forbids that from happening, from a, a being to exist that is about as big as a planet or a galaxy. Like there's nothing forbidding that in the universe from happening. And from the first time now, if you squint, we can sort of see how that happens. And silicon-based intelligence certainly seems to have a lot of strengths up its sleeve versus carbon-based intelligence. And so, no, I actually sort of means that pretty literally. It's, it's, it is sort of in line with the march of the universe, and this is the next step, perhaps. Uh, it is, it, it, it's significant. And so um, I, I am hopeful that we can manage this transition without us being destroyed. That's, that's what I want to happen. Does that imply an inevitability to advanced AI? I, I guess, you know, a lot of people out there would say, hey, let's pause it, slow the whole thing down. And then you get kind of, you know, the response from like an open AI where they're sort of saying, yeah, we do take these risks very seriously and we want to, you know, do everything we can to avoid them, but we can't really pause or we don't think that would be wise because, you know, then the compute overhang is just going to grow and then things might even be like more sudden and disruptive in the future. Where are you on kind of the inevitability of this, you know, increasingly capable AI coming online? I don't think it's totally inevitable. I am generally a huge believer in human agency. I think we can do pretty much anything we set our, mi our minds to. I see a contradiction, by the way, in the EAC argument that, like, on the one hand, it's inevitable to try to stop it. On the other hand, oh, my God, if you do this, you're going to stop it. <laughs> it's like, it's like oh, you, got, you got to decide here. So, unfortunately, it's not necessarily inevitable. I am actually worried. As much as the next guy, I agree there is a risk that uh, we overregulate and miss out on the upside. And the upside is significant. And, and, you know, if you look like during the Middle Ages, we successfully as a civilization stopped progress. And in a lot of countries, if you look at North Korea, they did it. They successfully stopped progress. So you can stop progress. Progress is not inevitable. And arguably, it is actually quite fragile. So, no, I don't think it's inevitable. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we can, again, I want us to get the upside without experiencing the downside. You know, a couple, I mean, the North Korea example is an, is an interesting one. You know, if I was going to kind of dig in there a little bit more, I might say, Okay, I can understand how, like, if things go totally off the track, then we could maybe enter into a, like a, a low or no or even negative progress trajectory. You know, if there were a nuclear war, you know, then like we may not, you know, come back from that for a long time. Or if whatever, an asteroid hit the earth or, you know, a, a pandemic wiped out 99%, like, there's extreme scenarios where it's pretty intuitive for me to imagine how progress might stop or, you know, just be whatever, greatly reversed or whatever. If I'm imagining kind of a continuation-ish of where we are, then it's harder for me to imagine how we don't kind of keep on this track, you know, because it just seems like everything is, we're in this, I would call it, you know, I don't know if it's going to be a long-term exponential, but if not, like we seem to be entering a steep part of an S-curve where Hardware, you know, is, is coming online by the order of magnitude. And at the same time, like algorithmic improvements are like taking out a lot of the compute requirements. And we're just like seeing all these existence proofs of what's possible and all sorts of little clever things and, you know, scaffolding along the lines of, you know, some of the stuff that you're building is getting better and better. Is there a way that we can like, do you think it is realistic to think we could kind of meaningfully pause or even like stop without like a total derailment of civilization? The derailment of civilization thing, like you could imagine the most extreme scenario, which I am not proposing, but you could imagine the most extreme scenario, which is no more Moore's law, right? You do not exponentially improve your semiconductors anymore. That'd be crazy, right? But that wouldn't derail civilization, right? Civilization is not predicated upon Moore's law. Like we would do just fine with the chips we've got today. And if anything, I think we have a lot of overhang from the chips we have today. A huge, huge, huge overhang, right? So um, I actually think it is possible to do that if we wanted to. And I don't think that even this, which I think is the most extreme scenario, uh, would actually derail civilization. Well, we are actually lucky in that there are a few choke points in the industry. Actually, more than a few. There is ASML, there's TSMC, there's NVIDIA. Like all of those three are individually, they're a choke point. Like a regulator could at any point grab one of them and be like, no more. 
you just stop, right? Oh, you add this chip into all of your GPUs moving forward, so we have a kill switch. At the very least, we have that. So if shit really hits the fan, we have an automatic thing in place that like shuts down every GPU on this, right? Now that would be uh, disruptive, but potentially less disruptive than a rogue ASI. So no, I actually think it is it is very much possible. These things all on the table, and I, I don't think they would be all that disruptive. So maybe that's a good transition to kind of where we are right now, right? We just had this executive order put out this week. And, you know, I think everybody's still kind of absorbing the 100 plus pages and trying to figure out exactly what it means. What's your high level reaction to it? And then I'll I'll get into some of the the specifics. First of all, it's an executive order for now. It is not law. It's, It's very early. Overall, I am pleasantly surprised, not by the specifics, but by the fact that we're reacting quickly by the fact that the the measures that are proposed are not insane. Like, I was afraid of, like, there's, there's a really good case to be made that's like, look, we have a gerontocracy to press in place. We have a bunch of 70, 80 years old governing us. They don't know anything. When they were born, there was no mobile phone, right? Can't really blame them for not really understanding anything. And so I was afraid that the regulation would go something like, if you install Microsoft Office in your AI, then you have to make a report. And so like, what? Like, so the, the regulation actually sort of makes sense. It's talking about flops. It's talking about all those amounts of training. So I, I think it's a step in the right direction. I'm actually I'm actually happy uh, about uh, what's happening with this executive order. Now the specifics. Look, it's um, the problem is that it's almost impossible to regulate AI in a way that doesn't have any loophole. So they are regulating it according to a number of flops, and that's that's okay. But at the end of the day, then then you get stuck into okay, what happens when you have uh, algorithmic improvements, what happens when you do RL instead of uh, fine-tuning. And like, there's just a lot of different loopholes that researchers are going to find. And so I think overall, it's an encouraging first step. It's funny, I've you know, there have been proposals around even like a flop threshold that would drop progressively over time in kind of anticipation of the algorithmic improvements. That's a, you know, even a more probably challenging one to, to uh, put out into the world, especially given, you know, people are not... Um, in general, great at extrapolating technology trends, or you know, don't want to uh, don't want to accept regulation in advance of stuff actually being invented. You know, do you, so we've got this flop threshold thing where, basically, as I understand it, so far, it's like if you're going to do something this big, you have to like tell the government that you're going to do it, and you have to bring your test results to the government. I would agree with that. That seems like a pretty good start, and ten, and also the threshold seems like pretty reasonably chosen at. 10 to the 26. Any, you know, kind of refinements on that or quibbles that you would put forward that you think like, you know, maybe the next uh, evolution of this should take into account? I think ultimately we're we're tiptoeing around the issue, but ultimately we need to come to an actual technical blanket solution. Like we will not solve (laughs) ASI alignment by asking for reports from AI companies. That's that's not how it's going to happen. So again, I think it's a step in the right direction. I'm happy we're taking action. I'm happy the action is not totally nonsensical. But at the end of the day, like we're gonna have to talk about the kill switch, right? The proposal uh, I just made is is one that I see more and more talked about, and I, that's the one I would I would feel best about. You've got to put this chip into your H100s and the government and there's like a centralized entity that can shut down all GPUs all at, all at once. And by the way, it wouldn't necessarily shut down every computer because your, your laptop doesn't have an H100, your phone doesn't have an H100, like that's fine. Over the long term, Moore's law makes it so that your laptop and your phone actually end up with a H100, but at least that buys us a few years to make progress on AI uh, safety and alignment. Ideally, we would then automate just like reportedly the Russians did during the Cold War, we would automate. Like we would set up some detection systems to, uh, God knows how we would do that, but hey, there's an ESI going rogue. Like the, the world is really changing rapidly. Assuming it's not too late, which it may be, because at that point, like, God knows, but you could very, basically that would give us the best weapon against the ASI. We would have like a gun against the ASI's head and boom, kill all the GPUs. You cannot operate anymore. God knows how effective that would be, because at that point, all bets are off. If you have an ASI, God knows what it does and how it protects itself. but uh, that would be what I would feel best about. Do you have any sense for how that would be implemented technically? Like, it seems like you would almost want it to be something that you could kind of 
broadcast. You know, you you almost want like a a receiver on chip that would react to a particular broadcast signal and just kind of because you would not want to have like you know an elaborate chain of command or you know relying on like the dude who happens to be on the night shift at the you know the individual data centers to go through and like you know pull some lever right so do you know of anybody who's done kind of advanced thinking on that 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 stuff is like you you hear a lot of these like kill switch things but in terms of how that actually happens so that it's not dependent on you know a lot of people coming through in a key moment i i haven't heard too much to be honest no, I haven't. I haven't seen too much research done on that. But you know, I, I think the, the technical challenge. There's nothing in principle that makes the technical challenge unsolvable. Uh, like we already have a chip that can be broadcasted to for like a dollar from space. Like this, like the GPS chip does a lot of chips, and like it costs. You, like you have one on your phone, and so why not put a GPS like chip? Maybe we could literally piggyback the GPS protocol. I don't know, but why not put a chip like that in every in every GPU? Again. If you have an ASI, God knows, like maybe it hacks the it hacks the chips before before you get a chance. You know, it hacks the satellites that broadcast the thing. I have no idea. But again, I, I think pointing in this direction is 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 where I would like things to go. In the limit, I think the um, basically, and that's like the most extreme version of this proposal. But like the Yudkowsky airstrike proposal, that's like. You cannot accumulate billions and billions of dollars of H100s and build this thing, else we will go up to else striking you. Uh, that, that's the most extreme version of this, but that actually, I think, is directionally correct. Like, we, this is going to be the most powerful force in human history, maybe even in the universe. You cannot accumulate that stuff any more than you can accumulate enriched plutonium, right? We've got to, we, we've got to forbid that at the lowest level possible. And so that level cannot be the application layer because the application layer is just, it's just too diffuse. There's like a thousand startups everywhere. Any kid in their garage can build one. It's got to be at, at a choke point. And the choke point today is the silicon. Yeah. Well, let's unpack that a little bit more because I think that has been an interesting debate recently. You'll hear this kind of call for let's not regulate model development. Let's regulate applications. And then, you know, we can kind of have medical regulation for the medical and everything can be more appropriate and like fit for purpose. And, you know, maybe there's something else to be said for that. But yeah, I mean, if you're really worried about tail risk, it's like probably not going to be sort of medical, you know, device style regulation of, you know, diagnostic models or whatever that is going to keep things under control. So. Or maybe you could even do a better job of, of steel manning the case for the application level regulation. But I guess, you know, why do you think that give, give your account of why that's not viable in a little bit more detail? Yeah, I think the steel man here is like, look, people are going to use forks to poke each other in the eye. That's not a reason to forbid the fork. Like forks are awesome. We love forks. Just forbid people from poking each other in the eye with them. Right. The problem is that as the fork in this analogy becomes more and more powerful, the argument loses more and more of its defense because ultimately it's just a risk benefit analysis, right? And so the risk becomes greater and greater as the artifact becomes more and more powerful. So more powerful than the fork, uh, an AR-15. And so, you know, the opinions vary about that. But look, at, at this point, if you look at the data, uh, you actually save lives by heavily regulating the sale of AR-15. You can't just be like, oh, sell them to everyone and just forbid people from shooting each other with them. It's like, it's an AR-15. What do you expect people to do with them, right? Now, uh, in, the more, in the most extreme scenario, enriched uranium. You can't be like, you can buy all the enriched uranium you want. You don't even need to fill up a form, which, by the way, that is all the executive order says right now. At least fill up a form. <laughs> can you please at least tell us what you're up to? Um, so, hey, you can, build, you can build all the enriched uranium you want. Um, just don't bond us with us, please, with it, please. Like we, we wrote it in this piece of paper, you can do it. Oh no, that's not that's not how it works. So that 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 is why I think it's important to regulate the the silicon layer. Do you have an intuition for sort of how likely things are to get crazy at kind of either various timescales or potentially various like compute thresholds? I was realizing I did an episode with Jan Talman a couple months back, just just in the wake of the. GPT-4 deployment, and he said, we dodged a bullet with GPT-4 or something like that. Like in his mind, we didn't know if, you know, even at the GPT-4 scale, 
like that might have already been, you know, no, no real principled reason to believe that with any with like super high confidence that that the GPT four scale was not going to cross some, you know, critical threshold or whatever. I guess I don't really have a great sense for this. I just kind of feel like and this is purely like gut level intuition that yeah, we could probably do like GPT-5 and it'll probably be fine. And then kind of beyond that, I'm like, I have no idea. Do you have anything more specific that you are working with in terms of a framework of like how, you know, when you hear, for example, Mustafa from um, Inflection say, oh yeah, we're definitely going to train, you know, orders of magnitude bigger than GPT-4 over the next couple of years. Are you like, well, as long as you stay to two to three orders of magnitude more, we'll be okay. Or that like, I, I just have no, you know, just we're just flying so blind, but I wonder if maybe you're flying slightly less blind than I am. I am of the opinion that GPT-4 is the most critical component for AGI, and that's the gap from GPT-4 to proper AGI is not research, it's engineering. It sits outside the model. So I think we have a capabilities overhang here that can turn GPT-4, as it is today, into AGI, into proper AGI. I think generally that's the case for any technology. If you look, for example, at Bitcoin, what changed from a technological standpoint that allowed Bitcoin to happen? It was the same technology we'd had for a while, and yet Bitcoin, Bitcoin took a while to happen. So there was this overhang, and, and Bitcoin, whatever your opinion about crypto, changed a lot of games, right? I think there's this huge overhang with GPT-4. I think we basically have the reasoning module of AGI, I don't know if you saw this paper that found literally just asking it, hey, take a deep breath and take a step back. Just take a step back apparently also makes a huge difference. So I think there's a lot of tricks like that that will make a difference. And also the, the sort of cognitive architecture layers around the GPT-4, I think, can bring it to AGI. That is also why you asked me about what sort of regulation I wish was put into place. We need to stop open sourcing this model. We don't know what kind of overhang exists out there. It, I don't think LAMA2 is there, but like I said, I think GPT-4 is there. So Lama 3, if it's GPT-4 level, boom, it's too late. The weights are out there. Okay, now you can do, you can, maybe you can bootstrap from there. So we, we need to stop open sourcing these things. I expect my timelines for proper AGI to emerge is two to eight years. I think there's a more than even chance of AGI emerging in two to eight years. I, I think the base scenario is things are going to go well, just for the record. I don't think there's like a 99% chance of doom, but even if it's 10%, I think it's, it's worth be, being very, very worried about. That's enough for me. <laughs> That's enough for me. 10% of all of them is dying. Like, let's talk about it, please. Um, so two to eight years, 50% chance of AGI. Uh, she, things probably will go well, except for, you know, civilizational disruption. There's going to be like stuff, there's going to be crazy shit happening, but two to eight years. And after that, all bets are off. I have no idea what the bootstrapping to ASI uh, look like, but I, I don't expect ASI to take more than 30 years. So I expect that you and I, in our lifetimes, we're going to see ASI. So that's a, a pretty striking claim. I think it probably puts you in a, a pretty small minority. And I don't think I'm really there with you when you say that you think GPT-4 kind of already contains the, you know, the kind of necessary core element for in AGI. So I'd like to understand that a little bit better. I mean, you'll have a lot of people who will say, you know, look, it can't play tic-tac-toe. I think on some level, those kind of, oh, look at these like simple failure objections are kind of lame and, and sort of miss the point because of all things it obviously can do. But I do, you know, if I'm thinking like, does this system seem like it has this kind of sufficiently well-developed world model or, you know, uh, I'm not even sure exactly how you're conceiving of the core thing, but I, you know, for for a question like that, I would say those failures maybe are kind of illuminating. On the other hand, I'm sure you've seen this Eureka paper out of uh, Nvidia recently, where they use GPT-4 as a superhuman reward model author to teach robot hands to do stuff, and I thought that one was pretty striking because, as far as I know, and I, I actually use the term Eureka moment, I've many times said, we don't see yet eureka moments coming from highly general systems. You know, we see eureka moments from like an AlphaGo, but we haven't really seen like eureka moments from a GPT-4 until maybe this. This seems like maybe one of the first things where it's like, wow, GPT-4 at a 
task that requires a lot of expertise, that is designing reward functions for robot uh, learning, robot reinforcement learning, GPT-4 is meaningfully outperforming human experts. Uh, and so I think it's very appropriate that they call it Eureka. What do you think is the core thing? You know, is it this like ability to have Eureka moments? Is it something else? Why do you feel like it's there? And, and does it not trouble you that it can't play tic-tac-toe? For the sake of this conversation, I'm, I'm going to define AGI as uh, a seed AI, an AI that can recursively self-improve. That's a much more narrow definition of AGI than most people use, but that's actually what I care about. Like, can we enter this recursive loop of self-improvement that bootstraps us to uh, ASI? In order to get there, you don't need to play tic-tac-toe. You need to be um, a good enough, and the word good enough here is important, a good enough either software engineer or chip designer or AI and ML researcher. One of these things. So something that can get you to bootstrap. And so good enough does not mean better than the best human. It doesn't even mean better than the average human. It just means good enough that you can make a difference, a positive difference in your own ability to get better, right? So if you, if you enter that recursive loop of self-improvement, then mathemat mathematically it's over. And yeah, when I see the NVIDIA paper, I see that. When I see our own experience with the model, so today we are using Lindy to write her own integrations and Lindy is writing more and more of her own code. Uh, I see that. Even as, as it pertains to AI researchers and ML researchers, I, my hypothesis is that OpenAI is using GPT-4 more and more internally to perform AI research. My not hypothesis, the fact is that NVIDIA is releasing papers that's like, well, not only can we use it for AI research through this Eureka paper, but we can also use it for chip design. It works super well. We trained an AI model that does chip design super well, right? So we are starting to see the glimpses of that kind of recursive loop of self-improvement. Basically, the, the world model question, I kind of want to sidestep because I feel like at this point, the debate becomes silly for, for people who argue that it's got or doesn't have a world model. What matters is, is it good enough? And so even if it just overfit its training set, even if it's just predicting the next token and not actually understanding anything, I actually really do believe it understands like a lot. But even if it's not, you can imagine there's like this many dimensional space with a ton of data points in there. And it's good by interpolating between the data points and it needs much more data points to understand anything than a human. And so there's that envelope in that space where the data points are dense enough that it, it can perform, right? And so that's called like the convex hole, okay? And then there's data points outside that convex hole and it, it does it does really poorly outside to the convex hole, much more poorly than humans. Its convex hole requires a lot more density than, than humans to exist, right? There's, there's, there's multiple questions, which are, one, all these data points inside, the convex hole is, is the sum of all human knowledge. So GPT-4 today knows more than you, right? I don't know that it can reason better than you, that's the expanding the convex hole thing, but it knows more than you inside that convex hole, right? And so inside that convex hole, an AI researcher that's read every paper ever, not just in AI, but in math and biology, every paper ever and it's the entirety of the internet, is it better than a human, than a human AI researcher? I think the answer is yes, right? Um, is yes. Uh, even if it's not better, like does the outside of that convex hole, and this is my point about the uh, capabilities of a hang, can we get this AI model to, through prompting, through cognitive architecture, to do better outside its convex hole? And we're seeing that all the time. We're seeing papers come out about like, hey, we have found an automatic way to rewrite a prompt that makes it a lot better. We have found a way that that paper that, that came out a few days ago that's like, hey, if you ask the model to take a step back and to rephrase the problem you're giving it in, in terms of a universal problem, it performs a lot better. Uh, and that makes total sense because the, the, the specific of the problem is, is, is pro it's probably not seen as that specific problem in its data set. But if you ask it to reframe it, it's basically translating the problem into a form in which it's, it's comfortable with. And so we're actually getting it to grow its convex hole like that. That's my take is um, I think the convex hole is good enough to get to that good enough point. And I think we can grow that convex hole. And so I think that basically if, if GPT-4 isn't a seed AI, for sure GPT-5 is one. Yeah, it's an interesting framing. I, I find your analysis there pretty compelling. The idea that, you know, given what we have seen from like a Eureka, you know, with this robot training, or um, there was another interesting one recently, I think it was out of Microsoft. I covered this in one of the research rundown episodes on recursive or iterative improvement on uh, on a software improver, 
So they basically take a real simple software improver, you know, that can improve a piece of software. And then they feed that software improver to itself and just run that on itself over and over again. And, you know, it kind of tops out because it's not, it doesn't, you know, in this framework, it doesn't have access to like tinkering with, you know, possible methods for training itself, but it makes significant improvement and gets us some pretty advanced algorithms where it starts to do like genetic search and, you know, a variety of things where I'm like, I don't even really know what that is, you know, like simulated annealing algorithm. I'm like, what? what, you know, but it comes up with that and, you know, uses that to improve the improver. And, you know, this is all measured by how effectively it can do the downstream task. It does seem like it's not a huge stretch to say that, you know, could you take the architecture of GPT-4 and start to do, you know, parameter sweeps and start to, you know, mutate the architecture itself. It, it seems like it probably can do that. And I would agree, you know, it probably does. Or certainly just, just based on what I do, you know, with GPT-4 for coding, I would have to imagine that it is in heavy use as they're, you know, performing all that kind of exploratory work, you know, within an open AI. And so, uh, yeah, and I think to your point, we are seeing enough of these signs of life across the board in a lot of different areas. A lot of institutions are like, ah, a little bit of Microsoft self improvement here, a little bit here, a little bit here. It's not very hard to imagine it getting to escape velocity, to imagine it going super critical and fast on threshold where it's like, okay, now boom, it can really take off. So, and I've actually heard multiple people from OpenAI say that uh, they believe, and I, I, I agree with the conclusion. And they actually told me that before I agreed with them, they told me that at the very beginning of the year, so before GPT-4 was widely available. And they told me, you know, we I think we're, we're like in a, we have AGI and we're in a slow takeoff. And at first I'm like, that's crazy, we're not. AGI so has been like, achieved internally. Well, they didn't say, sorry, they, they, didn't, like, they basically were talking about GPT-4. Right, like we, I, I think, and, and I, I am not representing that this is uh, the universal position at OpenAI, but I've heard multiple people from OpenAI and other labs tell me that we have a GI and we're in the slow takeoff. So, given that, okay, we've got this compute threshold. We maybe need a kill switch. Now I'm getting. You know, we started this conversation with me with my, you know, EAC uh, side coming out, and you know, being like, why can't we get my self-driving car on the road? and tolerate, you know, some reasonable amount of risk to do that. Now my other side is coming out and I'm like, okay, what else might we do, right? We've got the AI safety summit going on right now in the UK. I thought it was cool to see today that there's some kind of joint statements between Chinese and Western uh, academics and, you know, thought leaders in the space where they're kind of saying, yeah, we need to work together on this. Like human extinction is, is something that we think could happen if, if we're not careful. Do you have a point of view on kind of collaborating with China or co coordinating with China? I mean, that's a tough question, obviously. Nobody nobody really knows China, I don't think, super well. But what do you think about that? I mean, it, it, are we naive to hope? I guess I, I kind of feel like, what else are we going to do except give it a shot? Yeah, 100%. And, and there is ample precedent. You know, everybody is always talking about... Uh, this uh, coordination problem. It's like the, they've taken like the one-on-one course of game theory and they're like, look, we can't coordinate. Well, like if you take game theory one or two, it's like solutions to the coordination <laughs> problem, right? And, and so the solutions to the collaboration problem is uh, few players in a very iterated game. And that's, that is the game right now. There's very few players and they're, they're all in a very iterated game. They're not the best buddies, but they are actually able to agree on a lot of things. And so we can coordinate with, with China. And, and again, to your point, like what choice do we have anyway, right? And even if we do not coordinate with them, again, there's enough chokeholds, enough of which are American, right? NVIDIA is an American company last time I checked. And so there's enough chokeholds that we, we could actually do very much, not give them a choice. Like, hey, your GPUs now have the chip right here, um, you know? And so whether you like it or not, we have a satellite up here and we can kill all the GPUs, you know, uh, out there. Um, and, you know, that, that, that wouldn't be, we, we could even just downright forbid to be used, by the way, to be sold in China. Like, we've done stuff like that before. So, no, I, I, I think coordination is, is definitely possible, and, and I actually think it's going to happen. I, I'm actually really very much encouraged to buy, well, winning. Like, I think the safety side is making really good progress. There is rising public awareness. I think Jeff Hinton is doing an amazing work here. The regulation is coming. It's mostly sensical. There's this sort of progress that's happening across the board. 
AI labs are investing more and more in safety and alignment, even from a technical standpoint, the work that Anthropic is doing, I think is absolutely brilliant. Uh, so we're, we're making really good progress across the board here. I don't want to represent that, that it's over and that we're all doomed. Yeah, I totally agree. I would say my kind of high level narrative on this recently has been, it feels like we're at the beginning of chapter two of the overall AI story. And chapter one was largely you know, characterized by a lot of speculation about what might happen. And amazingly, kind of at the end of chapter one, beginning of chapter two, not all, but like a large share of the key players seem to be really serious minded and, you know, well aware of the risks. And it's easy to imagine for me a very different scenario where everybody, you know, all the leading developers are like highly dismissive of the potential problems. Uh, but it's hard for me to imagine a, a scenario that would be like all that much better than you know the current um, dynamic, so I do feel you know uh, like overall you know pretty pretty lucky or pretty grateful that you know things are shaping up at least um, you know to to give us a good chance to try to get a handle on all this sort of stuff. One last question: This is super philosophical. I know you got to go, but how much depends in your mind on whether or not let's say silicon-based intelligence or AI systems or whatever might become, or maybe already are, or, you know, I, I'm not sure how we would ever tell the kinds of things that have subjective experience, you know, does it matter to you if it feels like something to be GPT-4? Have you heard of uh, the word Mu? I think it's, it's in Zen philosophy, in, in Buddhism, there's this story that's like, uh, someone asked someone else, like, hey, does, can a dog have the essence of a Buddha? If the Buddha is everywhere and in every being, can a dog have the essence of a Buddha? And the answer to that is Mu. And Mu means neither yes or no. It's a, it's a way to unask the question. It's a way to reject the premise of the question. And, and, and basically in this, in this sense, it means that there is no such thing as the essence of the Buddha, right? It's like the same question as like, hey, what happened before the universe? existed. Mu, there was no before, because the birth of the universe was also the birth of time. So the will to be full only makes sense in the context of the universe. And so anyway, that's sort of my answer whenever I ask a question, when, whenever someone asks me a question about subjective experience and consciousness, I'm like, Mu, it doesn't exist. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's, in, it's immeasurable. It's not a scientific thing. Uh, and so Mu. Alrighty. Well, some questions bound to remain unanswered. And uh, I appreciate your time today. This is uh, always super lively. Next time, I want to get the Lindy update. And at some point, I want to get access. But for now, I'll just say, Flo Cravello, thank you for being part of the Cognitive Revolution. Thanks, Nathan.